Amen. Amen. Are you ready for battle? Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, just looking for someone to devour. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have to put on the full armor of God. <coughs> Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on the helmet of salvation with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith against the enemy's arrows. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember, be constant in prayer and alert. And with the power of the spirit, you will win the battle. While the world ravaged itself in war, the United States made a conscious decision to stay out of it. Poland, Denmark, France, all had fallen to the Nazis. Britain and the Soviets were engaged on a two-front war. All of Europe and Northern Asia were in complete upheaval. But we would watch and pray at a distance, hope for the best. Until one sleepy Sunday morning, just before 8 a.m. on December 7th, 1941, fire rained from the sky upon our naval base at Pearl Harbor. Four battleships sunk, three cruisers, three destroyers, 188 aircraft, more than 2,400 Americans died. We were at war. Whether we liked it or not, we did not, we were not afforded the opportunity to stay out of it. We've been walking through the book of Ephesians, listening to the way that the Bible describes our lives. And whether we like it or not, we're in the midst of spiritual battle. It rages on all around us. But fear not, because the Son of God who spoke all of creation into being, rendered the heavens. He came and he won for us the victory. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father. He sits as the head over the church and he now offers to us his armor. Amen. Take it up. Stand firm. We've been walking through piece by piece First, putting on the belt of truth, which is God's holy word to us. Our own preparation in battle. Putting on the belt of, of finding our true source in God's word. Next is the breastplate of righteousness. Christ's imputed righteousness given unto us for protection, giving us the ability to walk out in victory, to walk this thing out. Next, he gives us, he tells us to shod our feet with the gospel of peace. That is our purpose. It is our direction that we as messengers of the good news go out with the gospel. Then we're told on to put on uh, sorry, next we're told to pick up the shield of faith because there are flaming arrows that are constantly coming against us. Trial after trial in life, pick up the shield of faith that you and I can trust God's character. We can trust because we can see the cross of Christ and hide behind that shield of faith. Then put on the helmet of salvation, your protection, the constant assurance that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. An assurance, a confidence. And finally, we are told to pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You will notice, of course, that every other piece of armor is for our protection. It is a defensive posture, if you will. But we're not left without a weapon. We're not left without offensive capabilities. 
the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So pick it up. Listen as I read Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, all the way through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Look, That battle's there whether you want it or not. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, this morning, we read your word, not just for instruction, Father, but to learn and to understand that it is a piece of armor that you have given unto us for warfare, for the battle. Father, we pause right now to simply confess how little we use your word as a sword on the offensive to resist temptation and to fight for holiness. Father, we confess how little we consider our lives in the middle of spiritual warfare. How little we consider the severity and the importance of every day living for you and walking out in victory. We pray this morning, we pray right now as a congregation that you would teach us to drink deeply of your word and to learn how to use it in the middle of the fight, in the middle of the battle. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. I once met a young man who told me that he was a top gun fighter pilot. You could imagine my eyes got giant and big as as the movie Top Gun raced through my mind thinking of Maverick and Goose. Yeah, I attended Top Gun Drone Academy. I said, that's cool and all, but it's not quite the same. Warfare has changed drastically over the last 40 years, much less over the last 2,000 years. Nowadays, everything is done with pinpoint accuracy at a safe distance. Laser-guided smart bombs, cruise missiles, and drones. But war wasn't always this way. I always think back to one of my favorite movies, Braveheart. Combat was up close and personal, face-to-face and man-to-man. Sure, there were archers who would fire in, but most of the battle would be done with the short sword, hand-to-hand combat in struggle. Staring at your enemy face-to-face, Man to man, only one of us is going to make it out of here alive, either you or me. It was messy. It was intense, and it was personal. Most of us would prefer the modern-day style of warfare whenever it comes to defeating our trials and temptations. Uh, Jesus, could could you just send in some laser-guided bombs to help me deal with my anger issues? Maybe a few grenades to throw at my lust. 
Heck, even a javelin of the Spirit would be nice. Unfortunately, the Christian life doesn't work that way. The final piece of God's armor, of Christ's armor that he has given unto you is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God which is given for hand-to-hand combat. The the Roman soldier had a double-edged short sword, the most effective weapon whenever you are close and whenever you are in the midst of a battle. You see, up until now, we've talked about being prepared, preparing yourself with the word of God. We've talked about having purpose. That is knowing where you should go, that we should go out with the gospel of peace. We've talked about being protected with with a breastplate and with a helmet. And we've talked about hiding behind the shield of faith. Because undoubtedly, flaming arrows and trials and difficulty in life will come. But I have a question for you this morning. Christian, I want you to pause and I want you to consider your position as a soldier. Is it hunkered here behind the shield of faith, hunkered down because there are flaming arrows and difficulty that comes in your life? Now, certainly there will be seasons of your life that this will be your posture. You will find uh, your heavenly father is a tower of refuge, a shield to hide behind. But is this the permanent posture of a Christian? Hunkered down, anxious, filled with fear, hoping for the very end of life where you will get the promises of God. But in the meantime, just sitting here, is this the posture of you and your spouse? Is this the posture of your family? I hope not. Because that is not the posture of a Christian warrior. That is not the posture of that Christ intends you to have. He gives you a sword so that you can stand up and so that you can be ready and able to take the fight to the enemy so that you are armed, so that you are offensive, so that you are not always hunkered down, filled with anxiety and fear, just hoping for the next wave to pass on and to pass on. Rather, arm yourself. Take up your sword, the Bible, God's word of truth that was first given for your own preparation, but now is given for you to be able to attack the enemy, to go forward as a soldier. There's no better place for us to picture this Then when Satan tempts Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, turn with me in your Bibles there because I want to walk through this section of scripture in Matthew chapter 4. There's a lot that's going on here. I don't have time to do an entire, it would be a three-part sermon series on Jesus fighting this temptation. I'm going to give you a a few quick uh, highlights, okay? First of all, You need to understand that Jesus is mirroring Israel's temptations in the wilderness. When Israel came out of Egypt before they go into the promised land and when they're in the wilderness, Jesus is mirroring that. You know that because all three times Jesus quotes scripture from Deuteronomy 6 and 8. But where Israel fell short, Jesus succeeded. He, he is the victorious Israel in that sense. This is how he's being pictured. Luke tells us that when the devil had finished every temptation, indicating that Jesus had gone through many more temptations than just the three that are recorded here, okay? Therefore, we should view these three temptations as large category temptations, okay? 
Commentators have often uh, also talked about how Jesus' temptations here parallel Adam's in the garden. In other words, you'll see here in a second that we are called to take a deeper look at these temptations and not say that they solely apply to Jesus, right? Because you can't turn stones into bread. You're like, oh, I guess that doesn't apply to me. That's not how you're supposed to read these, okay? So I want to walk through these three temptations really quick, and I want us to see the way that Jesus uses the sword of the Spirit. The first temptation, all right, Jesus has gone into the wilderness for 40 days by the direction of the Holy Spirit. All right, similar to Israel coming out of Egypt in the wilderness, they are experiencing trial and difficulty as a result of following God. You see, that's the situation. Suffering as a result of obedience to God's spirit. Needless to say, Jesus is hungry. Think about it for a second. He's weak. He's tired. He's dizzy of thought. Our limited bodies need food and nourishment to function. And Satan comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to become bread. If God is your father, you deserve good. Just eat something. And Jesus responds by quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of mouth of God. In other words, Jesus says, God is my strength, that obeying his voice is my food, even in this moment of trial. Next, I want you to jump down to verses eight through nine. I want to take the third temptation second. Now, there, you'll see in a moment why I'm doing that. <clears throat> Luke, by the way, takes the temptations in this order. Jesus is taken up to a very high mountain. Listen as I read. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things that I give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus is able to see all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. When Israel was coming out of Egypt and God was taking them into the promised land, the promised land was a land that was beautiful. It was a land that was rich in nutrients. God called it a land flowing with milk and honey. But in Deuteronomy chapter six, God warns the people. He says, when you get into this beautiful land that I am giving to you, when you get the houses that you did not build, when, when you get the wells that you did not dig, when you get vineyards that you did not plant, don't forget me, God says. Don't forget me. Do not love the gift above the giver. And just like Israel, Jesus sees all the glory of the world. You got to pause for a second and think about how deeply this temptation had to affect Jesus for it to be a real temptation. The same way that after he fasted for 40 days, he is tempted because he is in the midst of suffering. Suddenly Jesus is allowed in, a, in probably a vision experience to be able to be tempted with all the pleasures and all the, the fruit, all that glitters in this world. To which again, he quotes Deuteronomy, this time 6, 13. And he quotes Moses, the warning that he gave to Israel. He says, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Those two temptations, they work as opposite ends. The first of them being suffering, that in the midst of suffering, you are tempted to take shortcuts. You are tempted to find a way out. The second one is that in, in immense prosperity, you are tempted to forget God. And then here, the second temptation, verses five through seven, and the third that I'm taking in our order. Then the devil took him into the holy city and 
had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And then he quotes Psalm 91, 11 through 12, where it says that he will command his angels concerning you and their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Right? Jesus will, Jesus, the angels will catch you. And wouldn't that be spectacular? Wouldn't that be an amazing way to prove that you are the Son of God, that you are the Messiah, that all would see and instantly believe? When Israel came out of Egypt, not only were they famished in the wilderness, but much of the time they became discouraged in their faith at times wobbly. Their response was to demand signs from God, proving that he was with them. And so they got to a certain spot and they demanded that water come out of a rock. But that's making yourself God and God your genie. And so Jesus, again, quotes Deuteronomy 6, 16. And he says, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In all three instances, as soon as Jesus quotes the scripture, now certainly this had to be done in faith. This is not magic words that if you just say the scripture, okay, because Satan quoted scripture. But I want you to notice, as soon as Jesus quoted the scripture in faith, because he believed it, the temptation was defeated. You see that? The reason I took the time to summarize these three temptations. One, I wanted you to see the large category temptations that all of us, okay, remember that temptation is not a sin, okay? We are all tempted to doubt God's goodness in the midst of suffering. But Jesus says, feast on God in the midst of suffering. Remember God's word. He is there. Feast on him. We are all tempted to forget God and to love money and the treasures of this world and to be fascinated with worldly stuff. Treasure God instead. Store up your treasure in heaven. We are all tempted to stand in the place of God, directing God, telling him to please put a rubber stamp on our plans, on, on our control. Do not test God. He's God. He is not your genie. You are not God. But secondly... What we must understand in the thrust of this sermon, as one commentator pointed out, if Jesus, the Son of God, used the Word of God in those temptations, right? He didn't just say, nah, Satan, I'm not going to do that. Nah, I don't want to. He didn't say that. What did he do? He quoted the word of God. If Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, used the word of God in the midst of battling temptation and trial against the spiritual forces that were against him, how much more do you and I need to use the word of God? I mean, seriously, think about it. Overwhelmingly, how do we typically fight temptation? I mean, when we're tempted to cheat on our taxes, to cover up something at work, to sleep with your boyfriend, to slander someone who hurt you, how do we typically respond? What if I get caught? What would my friends think? The people at church would think I'm a hypocrite. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. We are answering Satan with human reason rather than the word of God. I mean, that's like hitting him with a pillow rather than a sword. Because get this, he will eventually 
persuade you, they won't find out. Not a big deal. Hey, everyone else is doing it. Pick up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and use it. Use the Word of God in attack, in battle. Now, this means that we have to know how to use it, right? Like a soldier who has practiced with his weapon, who has taken preparation, we have to know how to use it. Notice, Jesus did not call a time out and say, let me go have a quiet time so that I can come back and answer you, Satan. A soldier is prepared. He knows how to use his sword. He is prepared. Why? Because guess what? He knows a battle is coming. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. As if it's strange that you're being attacked. Trials and temptation have come and guess what? They will come. They are coming. You already know how you have been defeated in the past time and time and time again. You know where your spouse struggles and you know where your children and grandchildren, where your family is under attack. You know where they struggle. Arm yourself. Pick up the word of God. Memorize it. Get ready for the battle. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had a counseling situation that's essentially gone like this. Pastor, I've been having panic attacks. I'm ashamed to tell you. I'm I'm filled with, with fear. Well, do you know where that comes from? Oftentimes they don't. And we'll spend an entire session just just praying and say, listen, it is a work of the Holy Spirit for him to show you the anxiety and to be able to put your finger on the issue of God in your life, of what's going on. Then he might come back. I'm worried about provision for my family, my job. Who's going to take care of my family if anything were to ever happen to me? Hey, what does God's word say about that? Then we we might turn to a passage like Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, listen, you don't need to be worried or filled with anxiety. Look, look to the birds. Do you see the way that your heavenly father cares for them? How much more valuable are you than them? And I would say to him, read this section from Matthew 6, 25, all the way through 34. And I want you to pick your your favorite verses. Which verses just leap off the page and then memorize them? Why? Because the battle's coming doesn't just go away because you because you came and you talked to me and we were able to put our finger on the issue. A battle is coming and there will be moments when your mind begins to race and you feel that anxiety, your heart begins to speed up. And in that moment, you need to have the word of God, which is the sword, which is able to answer the situation in your life. You know where you are attacked. How many times are you going to continue to fall to that same sin, to that same temptation? Are you tempted with lust? 
2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee youthful lust and pursue righteousness. Be like Joseph. Okay, get out of there. Don't stick around and kind of see how it's going to go this time. The word says flee. Say that in your mind. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man. And here's the good news. God, who is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, but rather through the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. You should be able to say that in the midst of the battle. Are you tempted to anger? James 1, 19 through 20. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Are you tempted with anxiety and worry? Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. But rather, in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Arm yourself. We are so tempted to fill our minds with everything about the word of God, the historical background, what this Greek word says and all that other stuff. And we never use the word of God like a sword that it has been given to you for battle. We we, we only do it for academic preparation. I mean, we have more resources than you could ever imagine in the history of the world, and so few of us actually pick it up and use it as a sword. Think about Paul's wording here, that he calls the word of God. He simply doesn't refer to it as the sword, rather the sword of the spirit. The spirit is attached to the word of God. Because it deals devastating blows. Because it is the truth of God. God's word will not return to him void. Especially in the midst of your spiritual battle for your family and for your marriage. The spirit of God promises to go with it and to fight the battle with you. Because it's his word. It is is the spirit breathed word of God. It's not just a sword, it's a sword of the Spirit. Think about that, the deep richness. Friend, what needs to change in your life when you go home after hearing this sermon? What scriptures do you need to memorize as you prepare to battle for holiness because trials and temptation are coming. I'm almost out of time, but I want to mention one other, one other way. Not only is, is the sword of the Spirit for your own battle in temptation, but it's incredibly powerful when you use it and you speak to other people in their life. I want to tell you a quick story. One time I was uh, on a flight back from Houston to Lubbock. I was headed back to Plainview where I was a pastor. And I happened to be sitting next to uh, a young lady who was a Texas Tech student named Alicia. In my personal life, I, I had read through uh, the book, Share Jesus Without Fear by William Fay. And he has an incredible technique where he challenges, he really charges you and says, listen, use God's word. Okay, use God's word. And in your witnessing situations, just let them read the scripture and ask them, what does this verse say? And then sit back and use God's word. Well, I'm sitting right there next to Alicia and we begin to have a conversation. She realizes I'm a pastor and quickly becomes uh, just kind of defensive and and off-put, to which I just, 
shift the conversation and say, hey, would, you, would it be okay if I just had you read a couple of these verses from God's word and then you tell me what they say and what they mean? She said, sure. And at that time, I prepared a little gospel presentation card, a little track that you just walk through these verses, let her read it, and then I just set back. The defensiveness suddenly starts to fade. Incredible news. By the end of that flight, she prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. I share that with you because the sword of the spirit, God's word, as we encounter people at work, friends, family, people in our neighborhood, allow the word of God, trust the word of God because it's a double-edged sword able to convict and to, and to divide even the deepest parts of mankind. Charles Spurgeon noticed in his day, just like ours, that God's word was constantly under attack. He also noticed the amount of energy and effort that Christians gave to defending the word of God. And he likened the picture to a soldier guarding a lion in a cage. There he is, the king of beasts, in all of his splendor, caged, surrounded by a bunch of soldiers who are exhausted in their attempt to preserve the lion by deflecting any possible assault that comes against him. This weapon is recommended, or that weapon, to which Spurgeon replies, pardon me if I offer a quiet suggestion. Open the door and let the lion out. He will take care of himself. You see, the lion from the tribe of Judah will soon drive away all of his adversaries. Believer, choose your metaphor. A sword or a lion, it does not matter. That so much of our lives is spent battling temptation in our own strength. But the lion from the tribe of Judah has rendered the heavens. He has come down to your defense and he is giving you his sword. The Holy Spirit has promised that that sword is able to do spiritual battle against demonic forces that you can't even comprehend. The question is, will you bother to pick it up? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, teach us to use your word. Teach us to hide your word in our hearts. Father, forgive us whenever we, we simply fill our minds with facts upon facts upon facts about your word and do not care about fighting for holiness. About protecting our families. And the constant onslaught that goes against the next generation and the next generation. And so few of us know how to fight. Father, we humble ourselves before you and to your word and we ask you teach us to wield the sword of the spirit effectively in our lives we pray all of this in Jesus name Amen. As the praise team comes and sings one final...